talk to you about Thornwell today, and I know they appreciate the support that we show by through the bunny money collecting every uh, fourth Sunday. But I did want to point out to you that November is Thornwell Emphasis Month. Um, the mission of Thornwell is to prevent child abuse and neglect, to build and strengthen families, to support healthy communities in the name of Jesus Christ. It was founded in 1875 in Clinton, South Carolina, by a young Presbyterian minister named William Plummer Jacobs. And the purpose was to care for the Civil War orphans. Well, he was visiting a woman named Sarah Anderson one time. She was a war widow. And he was talking to her and sharing with her that he felt led by God to start an or orphanage, but he just wasn't sure. Well, Sarah's son, Willie, was in the room at the time, and he heard uh, Reverend Jacob say that, so he left the room and then came back shortly and walked over to Reverend Jacobs and opened his hand, and he had a silver half-dollar coin in his hand, and he said to Reverend Jacobs, take this and build your orphanage. So that energized Reverend Jacobs' dream, and four years later, Thornwell was opened, and it's named for noted theologian James Henley Thornwell. So in the back, I put the little turkeys for the kids. They can put the quarters and bills in the middle. And there are also some grown-up envelopes. So if you feel so led, please support Thornwell with a donation. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry to spring that on you so That's quick. Okay. I was following the order of worship here. But uh, again, uh, welcome to worship here at Williston Presbyterian Church. Uh, my name is John Nettles, and my wife, Edie, and I bring you greetings and blessings from Bethesda Presbyterian Church in York. Uh, we're glad to be here with you today. Uh, announcements are in your bulletin and that you are familiar with and can see there. Are there others that need to be highlighted from the congregation at this time? If not, then I believe you have a recognition of the special bulletin. Who has that? Okay. <laughs> uh, with that being said, let us prepare our hearts for worship today with our uh, choral call to worship.
honest with ourselves about who we are, about the mistakes that we make, and about how well or poorly we care for others. Because we have faith in Christ, we dare to approach God with confidence in faith and in penitence. Let us confess our sins before God and to one another with the prayer of confession that's printed in your bulletin. Almighty God, we confess that we cannot see your image in each and every one of our neighbors. We call each other sinners. You call us by our names. We misjudge one another. We underestimate ourselves. We undervalue creation. Pardon us, the Holy One, by your grace. Reveal to us your vision for the world, that we may see all people through eyes of care or hearts of compassion. Here's the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. children's message, I completely forgot what I had. I, I mean, the whole lesson, just to drive it home, left it out, left, left all of it out. But today, we're going to talk about how God is enough. Um, so I'm talking to you because, of course, I mean, the kids are not here, but this is a children's show. So we had our town trick or trunk last night, trunk or treat. I never get it right. Trick or trunk, trick or treat. Anyhow, we had trunks and there was candy. But... We always worry if there's enough, you know, especially if you're in charge of them and you're the one that has to get people up there, you're going to worry about it. So thank goodness at five o'clock, people started pulling in. We're setting up. Everybody that signed up came. Everybody had enough candy. So my worry was for nothing. And I feel like as Christians, we can do that. We take all that worry on ourselves when really we're enough. All God wants is us. So that's what I want us to think about and pray about this week, especially as we go into the holiday season, because I feel like holiday season just kind of amps up that anxiety in us where we feel like it has to be more, 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 more. Um, we used to take the kids trick-or-treating once a year, but now there's 20 things to do. There's boo at the zoo, and then you have to do this at church, and you have to do this at school, and then you trick-or-treat. And it's, it's okay just to let it be enough. So we're going to pray about that this week. Dear God, help us to remember that at the crux of everything in our life, it's always you. We can have this, we can have that, we can worry ourselves into just a, a mess, but you're enough for us. Help us to remember that this week as we get overwhelmed and as we go into the holiday season. We pray these things in your name. Amen. <laughs>
there are those specifically that need to be mentioned this morning. If not, I would like to mention a one from Edie and I, a very dear friend of ours, uh, much like here was a, uh, a, a, a deeply rooted in the history of the church. Uh, she unexpectedly passed away this week. Uh, so I would like for you to remember in your prayer, if you will, Miss Nancy Moore Smith. Uh, it's quite a shock to all of us, and that's on our hearts this morning uh, between my wife and I and our church. Uh, if there are no specific things, let us go to the Lord and pray. God of heaven and of earth, through Jesus Christ, you promise to hear us when we pray to you in your name. Confident in your love and mercy, we offer our prayer. Loving God, empower the church throughout the world in its life and witness. Break down the barriers that divide. That united in truth and love, that that church may confess your name, share one baptism, sit together at one table, and serve you in one common ministry. Let, Lord, let all the wisdom that is true guide the rulers of the nations. Move them to set aside their fear, their greed, their vain ambition, and bow to your sovereign rule. Inspire them to strive for peace and justice, that all your children may dwell secure. Free of war and injustice, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear the cries of the world hungry and suffering. Lord of all, renew our nation in the ways of justice and peace. Guide those who make and administer our laws to build a society based on trust, truth, and respect. Erase prejudices in all people of every race and creed that feel oppressed. Fill us with your holy word. Sanctify us with your Holy Spirit, freeing our hearts from crime and violence. Guard our youth from the perils of drugs and materialism. Give all citizens a renewed vision of life, of harmony, grounded firmly in your holy word. Lord of patience, strengthen this congregation in its work and worship. Fill our hearts with your self-giving love, that our voices may speak your praise and our lives may conform to the image of your Son. Nourish us with your word and sacraments, that we may faithfully minister in your name and witness to your love and grace for the world. Lord of mercy, look with compassion on all who suffer. Support with your love those with incurable and stigmatized diseases, those unjustly imprisoned, those denied dignity, those who live without hope, those who are homeless or abandoned. And as you move toward us in love, so lead us to be present with them in their suffering. In the name of Jesus Christ, sustain those who need your healing hand. We pray for those who may be sick, suffering from cancers or other illnesses which leave them without hope. We pray for those and ask you to give hope that may be near death, reminding them that you are ever present, reminding us that you are ever present to them through us. Uphold all who suffer in body and mind. We remember your servant, Nancy Moore Smith, this morning and the life she gave to her community and to our church at Bethesda. And Lord, you know many of those that we go unspoken here. We ask you to remember those, those that are in our heart, and be with them and strengthen them. Lord, we lift up all of these prayers and ask that you hear us now as we pray together the prayer your son taught us to pray. Pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, your will be done.
prepare for our lesson today. Last Sunday in October, this is Reformation Sunday. This is important to us of the Reformed faith. So I thought it would be appropriate for us to spend a little bit of time this morning in Paul's epistle to the Galatians. It was this epistle that opened the eyes of Martin Luther so many years ago. He felt overwhelmed when confronted with the holiness of God, and he recognized how weak he was and thought he could never do enough to be righteous enough to stand before a holy God. And it was through the book of Galatians that he found out that all he needed was Jesus Christ. So that is at the heart of where we are teaching this morning. But for now, let us prepare our hearts. Oh God, bring before us our hearts. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may obey your will. Guide us, O oh God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light in your truth, find freedom, and in your will discover your peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our text today comes from Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 26, actually. Uh, if you have your Bible, please follow along with us because... Um, We'll be taking that this morning, and uh, it will be good to keep place. But let me read now. Let's hear now the Word of God. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger and rivalries. I'm sorry. Now, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these things, there is no law. And those who belong to Christ have crucified. Jesus Christ has crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, embering, envying one another. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When it comes to the world religions, motivations for morality or behavior generally fall into two categories. Motivations that are based on fear and motivations that are based on a dynamic love. Of course, the Christian gospel being the latter of these. As the Reformed believers, we might express these motivations as one being based on works or one being based on unmerited grace. Now the motivation of works is used to avoid, preclude, appease, and compensate for fear. This path is proven to be best, at best, temporary. And then, of course, more appeasement or works are needed. It is the good news of free grace in which Paul spent his ministry <laughs> proclaiming that leads to the freedom from fear, released from our own desires. Chapter 5 of Galatians is about freedom, especially freedom 
from our own natural sinful heart that comes when we agree to surrender to Christ and live by the Spirit. You see, we struggle with a persistent conflict between a longing desire to create a spiritual heart glorifying a holy God and a sinful nature that often becomes inflamed by the seemingly unchecked evil of others. We can relate to this. The word hypocrisy fills our ears and hearts even today. When we see hypocrisy, we often find ourselves living in the midst of anger, rivalries, dissensions, and divisions. Psalm 73, the psalmist wrote this, Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure of heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my ste steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterwards, you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is my strength. He is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. This psalm exposes the back and forth struggle that we have. The psalmist says, when I see the prosperity of the wicked, my heart changes. I struggle. I'm envious of their prosperity. I'm arrogant. I'm envious of their arrogance. How can they be so arrogant in the face of God, in the face of the but nevertheless, in spite of all this, I will rely on you. I will walk in step with you, Lord, and let you guide me with your counsels. Your spirit, Lord, is my strength, and you are my fair portion. As we approach today's text, I always do this in Bible study. Whenever, whenever I read a passage, I think it's good to say, why was this written? Because as we know, there's no useless words in the Bible. Everything's there for a purpose. So when Paul wrote this letter, why was he writing it? Why was he writing this section? Paul had raised up the Galatians and many other churches, and then the Judaizers had come in and were trying to mix in some work. They were trying to bring in part of the Jewish law, the circumcision, the other law. You, okay, you can believe in this Jesus Christ, but you've got to also do this. And, and they had begun to get confused, and they were fighting with one another. And Paul comes in, and he says, uh, we really have to back up about three verses to, to get the, the meat of that. Uh, back in Galatians 13 through 15, Paul writes, For you, brothers, were called to freedom, but do not use that freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is fulfilled in a single decree. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you keep on biting and devouring one another, watch out or you will be consumed by one another. You see, the people of Galatia were using the gospel of salvation as an opportunity to feel conceited in their faith justifying the acts of a simple heart and not treating one another with a spiritual love. We see from the text that their actions had taken them to the point where they were biting and devouring one another, an image of dogs and wild animals ripping away at the meat of its prey they had taken down comes to mind. I feel like we see some of that today. And Paul says, if you keep doing this, you will be consumed eliminating one another. Paul says, if you keep this up, your society cannot break, survive. And that brings us to the point of today's gospel message. Paul writes, but I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, 
For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. And if you do that, you will keep from doing the things you want to do. In the opening verses, Paul exposes the problem. He explains the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. Now make no mistake, this is a spiritual war going on within us. When he speaks of the flesh, it's not a conflict between the outside of our body and the inside of our body. He is speaking about the heart and its inclinations. The inclinations of a natural, sinful man. Paul is talking about the flesh and the spirit, each producing character qualities within us. Notice verse 16 says, uses the words gratify and desire. It says you will not gratify the desires. You will not gratify the untrusting flesh. A heart not yet surrendered to relying on Jesus Christ. Desires for gratification of a sinful nature. Sometimes maybe your translation uses the word lust. The word comes from the Greek word meaning an over-desire. An inordinate desire. An all-controlling drive. Living the way of the Spirit is what we most deeply want. Yet our sinful nature continues to generate alternative, competing, controlling desires. It covets the place that the Spirit has. And the Spirit longs and works against the over-desires of the flesh. The Spirit longs to show us Jesus and conform us to Christ thus working against the flesh. Let's be clear now. The heart does not have an over-desire for bad things. We are not longing for evil. Not at all. The heart has an over-desire for pleasurable things. Those things that will sedate us from evil. When we are oppressed by evil and discouraged, we look for things that will just block it out of our minds. And that can quickly lead to Placing our focus somewhere besides Christ and on some other idol. We shift our, our, our attitudes away from God and towards something else. Often we focus on our own attitudes and our own on our own selves. And sadly, when we're angry and arrogant, our heart changes, and we might be motivated. And these motivations in essence, hold us bondage, and they govern us. This is what's at the heart of what Paul's saying. He's saying when you give away to that, you are now under a new bondage. You're under the bondage of your own sinful nature that's holding you there, controlling you, filling your mind and filling your heart with evil thoughts. The absence of love remains so we need freedom from this bondage. Paul tells us if you are led by the Spirit, then you're not under this bondage. This word, he uses the word law, and we think of law as a rule. But in, in this context, we think of it as governing us. Laws govern us. And he's saying we're not under the governance of our evil passions. Paul is stating that if we are willing to be led by the Holy Spirit, then we can free ourselves from living by a heart centered on perceived needs, a heart that manufactures all consuming drives in order to obtain those needs. When we are willing to surrender and be led by the Spirit, our hearts no longer are held in bondage under the governance or that law of our sinful nature. Now Paul tells us that the works of the flesh are evident. We can see all of these. They're not just random words. These are intentional choices that address the whole life. The words in nine, verse 19 have to do with the works of the flesh. Uh, three of the words in verse 19 have to do with works of the flesh that are centered around uh, sexuality and morality. There are two words in verse 20 having to do with the area of religion idolatry and witchcraft. The witchcraft, not like we're thinking about it, but it's talking, it comes from a Greek word, I can't 
can't do reading. So farmer, gas, farmer, you may know what that is. Uh, or medication. Those, and it means those actions which soothe us and insulate us or medicate us. That's the witchcraft he's talking about. It's, it goes back to that sedation uh, uh, from those things that bother us. Four of these are destructive attitudes. Enmity, strife, jealousy, and envy. And four describe are the results of those attitudes. Attitudes in our relationships. Fits of anger, discord, discord, dissension, divisions. Then the last two words are linked to drunkenness and orgies. Now this is not speaking of sexual orgies, but drunken orgies. Or addiction to pleasure-seeking substances and behavior. And then Paul concludes with a warning. I warn you, as I have warned you before, that those who do such will not inherit the kingdom of God. <coughs> the kingdom of a spirit-filled life in Christ. Now this may cause us to wonder for a moment. Is this kingdom of God a place? Or is it a condition of the heart? We speak a lot about the kingdom of God. <coughs> we tend to think about it maybe as heaven, maybe something greater, but maybe the kingdom of God is the condition of our heart where God lives. I thought about this week as I went over this. Now in verse 22, Paul makes a sharp transition. But the spirit but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. You've heard these. And against such things there is no law. These are not governing behaviors. Notice the language Paul uses. Paul chose his words carefully. Up until this point, in the previous section, he was talking about the acts of a sinful nature. But in verse 22, he's talking about the attitudes of a spirit-filled heart. Moving from an outward response to the world to an inward response when things like this trouble us. Notice the fruit of the spirit it's a single word. We often think the fruits of the Spirit. This is the fruit of the Spirit. Not many fruits, but one fruit with many characteristics. Why the illustration of the single word fruit? Christian writer Timothy Keller explains that Paul's word choice of fruit takes on an agricultural nature to help us understand the growth in our spiritual life. First, Christian growth is gradual. You may not always see it, but it's taking place. Sometimes it's not visible until it becomes in times of trouble. Maybe sometimes seeds do not sprout until they have been exposed to extreme fire. But even that is God's plan for assurance that there will be a remnant. Second, growth of the Spirit's fruit is inevitable. It will grow once it's planted. Perhaps you've heard this story of a minister who was in Italy, and there he saw a grave of a man who had died sometimes, maybe a hundred years, century before, who was an unbeliever, completely against Christianity, but a little afraid of it too. So the man had a huge stone slab put over his grave so he would not have to be raised from the dead in case the resurrection came. He had insignias put all over that slab. I don't want to be raised from the dead. I just don't believe. Well, evidently, when he was buried, an acorn must have fallen into the grave. So a hundred years later, when this minister visited, that acorn had grown up through that slab. It's now tall, towering oak tree. And the minister looked at it and asked, if an acorn which has the power of biological life in it can split a slab of that magnitude, what can the acorn of God's resurrection power do in my life? When the Holy Spirit motivates your heart, growth and change is inevitable. Third 
word, the fruit of the Spirit, has an internal root. This has to do with the life within the heart. A simple display of characteristics on the outside does not necessarily mean there is fruit growth on the inside or a spirit renewed heart. Keller states that you could take apples all over the branches of a tree. That doesn't mean the tree's alive. Sometimes we see that. Sometimes we see those who want to display all kinds of spiritual acts, but when you look closer, you wonder where is Christ in the heart? Fourth, Christian growth is symmetrical. Paul uses the singular word fruit to describe the whole list of things that grow in a spirit-filled heart. From this we learn that the real fruit of the spirit grows together. It's not separate, but they're all growing together. As we grow in Christ, and if we're centered in Christ, then we develop patience, gentleness, joy, kindness. It all comes as one package. Now, that doesn't come at once. It's a work. But it's there. Well, some of these traits may, traits may be stronger than others based on temperament or individuality. A balanced heart needs a portion of all of them. <coughs> Apostle John tells us to love God, we must show spiritual fruit to our brothers. If we do not, then we're a liar. You've heard the scripture that if anyone says he loves God but hates his brother, he's a liar. To love God, we have to love each other. Passing on the love of the Creator shows us the grace and mercy given to us through Christ's crucifixion. Undeserved, but given freely. Now the good news from Paul. We can have freedom in Christ because those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. We belong to Christ. When, when we belong to Christ, we have impaled the flesh with its passions on the cross. We have given them over to him to control with his leading. If we'll just let him. Christ takes all of those things with him. Finally, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not be conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Together, all of us need to walk as one. Let us rely on the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. I need you to walk with me and hold me upright and hold me steady. Correct me when you see me walking out of step with the Spirit. Hopefully you need me. We need each other. And most of all, we need to walk together as one in the Spirit. Always in step together. To God alone be the glory. Amen. <laughs> having heard the word of God, having been fed by the word of God, Let us now confess what we believe. I'm reciting the yeah. Apostles' Creed together. Christians, what do we believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived in the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the Pontius Pilate, was crucified and dead.
We ask you to accept this offering of your people. Remember in your love those who have brought it. Remember also those purpose and persons for which it is given. So follow this sacrifice with your blessing that it may promote peace and goodwill and advance the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you. 